And welcome to an exciting special episode of The Energy That Surrounds Us. I'm your host, Michael, and I am joined today by my great friend, Kathy Tierney Cogliano. (laughs) Thanks, Michael. So for all of you who are tuning in, today's episode is a special one. Because I met Kathy in Egypt, and we had so many experiences there that we've been sharing that we thought, let's do an episode all about Egypt in a way that most people probably would never see. (laughs) Oh, yeah, we saw a lot. Listen, I truly, and I don't use this word lightly, it was an epic journey. It really was um, on many levels, many levels. Yeah. It was. And it was such an amazing group that we were with that, I mean, I'm normally shy about stuff. And I remember after dinner going around and doing Reiki. Yeah. uh, (laughs) That is like totally not normal for me. So it was like really cool group. And it was yeah and and you know honestly you doing the reiki and sharing that that energy you did with us i really do believe i know for me it really helped to ground me because we would have days that are packed going into these temples and these sacred places that still to this day hold amazing powerful energies so at the end of a day i'm sure you felt it too you were almost drained because of the um, just the vastness of those um, high level energies that surrounded us each and every day. Um, so thank you for that, Reiki. It helped a lot. <laughs> You're welcome. And ironically, at the end, like I would be feeling drained on the land. But the second we boarded our boat on the Nile, I was like instantly recharged because I've learned how to absorb from the water being Piscean. So it's like, I was in my element and I'm like, it's all around me. I was like, all right, I'm good to go. Let's go again. (laughs) Yeah, that was magic, pure magic to sail the Nile. It truly was. You know, I've learned that I've had many past lives in Egypt over the years. um, And there was truly for me, and I, I believe for a lot of people and probably yourself as well, Michael, when you go to Egypt, it for me was like going home. It was going back to the ancient Lama Kemet. Um, it was in being on the Nile just brought that home even more so. Uh, that feeling of having been here before, knowing these waters, um, it was magic, pure magic. Not only that, but the fact of knowing every step I'm taking is the same as the steps they were taking thousands of years ago and the landscape hasn't changed much so it's like we literally could say we were teleported through time because it was like we were back in ancient times yeah and you know i think we've spoke about this before michael um i actually had um I don't know if we want to call it a time slip or what you just said. You know, I, I, I was just instantly brought back to a couple of different past lives when I was there in Egypt. And I, I'll never forget it. I mean, it's as though um, all of a sudden everything around you is gone. All of the rest of our group. And, you know, it happens usually when I'm, I'm made to be by myself. And and then, bam, it's like I'm all of a sudden looking out of someone else's eyes, but yet, and I can look down to see who I was. And I mean, it's that type of thing that um, is remarkable, um, you know, and that that particular um, first um, uh, experience happened when we were at the Sphinx. I mean, you must feel the same way when you get to the Giza Plateau and you stand at the foot of the Sphinx, it is beyond. I mean, the scope and the size of that um, Sphinx is remarkable. And to think it was all carved out of one 
big part of the stone that was there. Um, it, I, oh my goodness, it was, um, it was quite something. Right, and for those that are watching that, you know, look at the pictures of Egypt and everything, I'm going to dispel a couple of myths right here, right now. First myth is that the Sphinx and the pyramids are not closely together. That is actually a myth. The Sphinx is actually at the foot of the Great Pyramids. And the second myth is everyone always says there's three Great Pyramids. There's actually nine there, but people only take pictures of the large three and the smaller ones get kind of just pushed to the side and people don't realize that yeah it's a massive complex up there yeah it is truly um yeah you know maybe what i'll do is i'll quickly share that um you know i guess we could call it out of body experience we could call it a time slip you know, when we all went down, that was our first day, if I'm not mistaken, is we went to the Giza Plateau. We stayed at the Mena House, which literally, I don't know about where your room was, but when we got there to that hotel, I can remember opening the curtains to my room to where the balcony is and looking up and going, oh my God, the Great Pyramids are right there. It was, oh God, it, it sent chills down, down my back. Yeah, um, but like that first uh -huh. Yeah, it's that moment where it's like, this is real. Yeah, it's we're here. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. So that was the, that was our first foray out as a group was to go to the Giza Plateau. And it was a great way to start that trip. And we, if I'm not mistaken, we went down to the Sphinx first. And then we, and actually we didn't go to the Great Pyramid per se mm -hmm. until our last day. That was kind of like the, you know, we had this buildup until we got to the Great Pyramid, which that was, you know, that, that was that was another incredible experience to speak of too. But I'll just quickly share, you know, uh, when we got to the Sphinx, you know, our group, I think we were about, what were we, about 18 of us plus William and Claire. We traveled with William Henry mm -hmm. and his wife, Claire Henry. William, of course, on Ancient Aliens and writer-producer. I mean, who better to go to Egypt with, honestly, than William Henry and Claire? <laughs> so it was, that in itself was quite cool. Um, and I can remember standing at the Sphinx. Um, you know, everybody's kind of doing their thing walking around and what i took note of is that there was an altar and and it's not often depicted in photographs usually you get the steel um the dream steel that's in the middle of the pause and that's the big carved stone that tells the story at tutmos the third how before he was pharaoh how he fell asleep at the at you know the sphinx at that time was almost fully covered and he fell asleep at the, I think it was fully covered to about here. So just part of the head was showing. And that's where he had this amazing dream. And, um, you know, he was told that clear away the sand from the Sphinx, dig it out. And he will, the Sphinx will make him a Pharaoh. And sure enough, uh, you know, Tutmos the third was, um, you know, made Pharaoh. Um, but at the Sphinx, um, there is this altar piece, altar stone. And what struck me was, is it had four holes on each corner, kind of like board in holes. And I can remember standing there going, what the heck was that all about? And as I stood there, all of a sudden I realized I'm by myself. So everybody kind of had scattered about. And I, all of a sudden, I'm, it, it, I think this is where the outer body experience happens. I'm not, I'm not in my body any longer. It's as though I'm looking out of someone else's eyes. And I can remember I looked down and I knew I was a female. I was dressed all in white. I was a high priestess. And with me was this whole entourage and I'm carrying a child. And I can, to this day, look down. I can see it's like a little movie reel. And I can remember thinking, huh, this isn't my child. I had no attachment to this child. The child was swaddled in beautiful um, um, cloth of gold. And we're approaching this altar. And 
the the dream steel stone is not between the pots. So this, in my mind, goes way back. Um, and we approach the um, the Sphinx and we approach the temple, the um, altar stone. And behind the altar stone are a group of priests, all men, all dressed in white. So our procession comes up to this altar stone. And what's interesting is, is in the four gored out holes were these poles that came up. And then on top of that created this shaded effect of this beautiful golden fabric that covered the top of the um, altar. And so as my um, entourage approached, I'm, I'm front in line and I hand over this child to the, the head priest who comes forward behind on the other side of the altar. And I hand this baby to this priest and he lays the baby on the altar stone. And then it was as though all of a sudden, that was all I was allowed to see and experience. Then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm back into my body. Um, don't know if you'd call it a time slip or an out-of-body experience, or maybe a blend of both. And then I'm standing there. And again, I can, I can remember noting, oh, my God. Whoa. And again, nobody's around me. And I can remember taking a few minutes to just almost like fully integrate back in my body and go, what the heck just happened? But I intuitively knew, and it was very upsetting to me at the time, and it still is when I talk about it, that I believe that that child was used as a sacrifice for the time of year to allow the waters of the Nile to rise, to allow the rain to come, to allow the crops to grow. It was all a cycle and that, you know, very quite a long time ago. That's why, you know, it predates the dream steel stone is that I, I believe this was very, very ancient Egypt that, that this particular um, uh, time slip happened. But that child was used as a sacrifice for the waters of the Nile um, and for the crops and for the you know feudal land. Um, so that that was um, that was interesting. So Michael, that was the first day out, and I had that happen. <laughs> I know. So it was a remarkable trip. <laughs> and it was amazing. I mean, we actually got to touch, lean against, you know, we probably could have climbed on the Sphinx, but, you know, out of respect, we didn't climb on it. But I remember leaning, leaning against it when I was taking a photo and feeling drawn to an area but I think we were getting close to time to leave, and I think the area was one of the paws. And I don't know if it's the front right paw that everyone says is where the Akashic Records are, but I remember leaning up and going, there used to be a door here, and going, when did they close this door? And it doesn't look like there ever was anything added. So it's like, I have to sit there and wonder, it's like, is the door still there? And yep. we just don't yep. see it? It's there. It's there. We're, certain people are meant to see it. Others, not meant to see it. So interesting that you sense that. Because I trained um, in accessing the Akashic Records. And of course, Edgar Casey, that's where he places a lot of the, you know, the, the hall of records, um, the Akashic records are stored there. And in that class, I learned that we all were told we would have a, you know, a main guide in accessing the Akashic records. And my main guide stepped forward and it was Jesus. And I was like, Ooh, okay, now that's a guide. And every time I access the Akashic records, Michael, um, that's where he brings me we go to that right paw of the sphinx and he is able to just it feels it looks as though it's a gentle push to a certain part and there is a door that opens and we go in and not only are the akashic records there but so are the emerald tablets um it, it, it's remarkable every time i do this you know exercise that i connect with him and we go into the hall of records it's my stuff. So I'm so, I think it's so cool that you have that sense 
that, and of course, I didn't learn about that until, you know, a couple of years after going to Egypt. I wish I knew at the time, you know, I, I had trained in the Akashic Records um, after the fact. Um, but that's where we go, is that's exactly what happens as we go through that right paw, the Sphinx. Um, yeah, and just for those watching, the Emerald Tablets we're talking about are the Emerald Tablets of, and we were uh, debating this, is it Toth? Or thought. Toth, yeah. <laughs> so, Every, everybody has a different take on the pronunciation. But yeah, and I mean, like we said, you know, that was a great way to start. And I will say, as for the fact we were in the meta house, which was like you could describe it as a compound, we did have a security guard. And we were told if we went into town on our own, we needed to take somebody with us for protection. But in all honesty, I never felt threatened there. It was I like, didn't either. Yeah, not at the Mena House anyway. No, I, I really didn't feel threatened anywhere in Egypt. It was like everywhere we went, it was like everybody was nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, some marketeers were a little pushy, but... You know, that's your yeah. job. That's what they do. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Oh, they can get pushy. I can remember. I forget. Forgive me. I forget which temple it was. Um, it might have been Abydos. Set back. And our group, um, you know, I kind of lagged behind. And our group had gone forward ahead of me. And all of a sudden, I am surrounded by these men who are selling stuff. Some of them are on camels. I mean, they literally surrounded me. So that we had some armed guards with us um, at that particular site. And one of the armed guards, thank God, saw what happened to me. He comes running back with his gun out and yells in Egyptian at these guys and, and literally pulls me out of this mass of these men on Campbell's and whatnot and, and brought me back up to the rest of my group. I was just like, good Lord. I almost, I don't know what would have happened there had he not, you know. So, so it was going down for me, but yeah, they can get a little, little, little pushy with the trying to sell you stuff, but I get that, you know, that's yeah, how they that, make their that, living. <laughs> yeah, that's everywhere. I mean, I, I don't know of any place like that you would go where they're not. But yeah, and then we got to go, I call it a river cruise for the majority of the trip was we would go to temples during the day, sleep on the Nile at night on a, on a barge style boat. And it was just amazing that boat and our sleeping quarters were on one level. And then there was an eating kind of buffet area on the next level up. And then there was the top deck where you could just stand and look at the skies beautiful it was it was absolutely magical um yeah i love the, i love the time in the nile um it uh it, it almost sets the stage for everything you know that uh you know you're right there in the middle of it all um what was your favorite temple i would say my favorite temple would have to be a toss-up between filet because I have, I feel a connection to ISIS, and I would say the Assyrian, where we got to see all those circle of lives. Yeah, yeah, that was beautiful. Um, yeah, I have to say, um, mine was actually one of the smallest temples we went into. It was at Karnak, and it was the small, very private. Uh, we got permission, William got permission to allow us to go into this temple was the temple of Sekhmet. And she's the um, Egyptian goddess of, I want to say war. She's a mother goddess, but she's a fierce, protective goddess. And she's got the head of a lion and the body of a woman. In fact, she's right behind me. Oops, over here. Oh, ah! <laughs> I hate this. It's going the wrong way. She's behind me. Uh, <laughs> between two crystal pyramids. Uh, I love Sekhmet. Her energy. She's a guide for me. She's she's around. Uh, in fact, I have done other interviews and other podcast shows where um, we have gotten some growling. Um, was it Sekhmet? 
going to bed. Uh, she's made herself known, let's say. Um, and I just loved, it's a very small little temple. And so, you know, the doors unlocked, we were able to go in and, you know, Karnak otherwise is massive. Um, and you go in and there is the most stunning um, sculpture, a uh, statue of Sekhmet carved out of black granite. And she is powerful. And I can remember hearing others, you know, some of the guides and things say that it's, she's alive. And I don't know about you, but when, when I went in, I, I just felt this urge. I had to go behind her. And I can remember I put my arms like around her shoulders. And I'm not kidding you when I say I could feel her breathing. I could feel like a purr inside her body, like a vibration. And it was amazing. And that's where um, our guide Hatim had put on his phone and he had taken a video and the orbs that were coming out of her body, they pretty much came out of the middle of her body, came out, swirled around her, went up. It was unbelievable. And to the point that I could see them with my naked eye, I don't know if you saw that, but then you you saw the footage he took on his phone. It's like, oh my God. I mean, those were not dust orbs at all. I mean, they had a they had an, a movement to them that would not have been dust orb related. <laughs> but that's the power of Sekhmet. Right. And another of the cool things of going to the temples is, I mean, we see the pictures and the books of all the glyphs and everything. And to see the hieroglyphs literally right in front of you, and it's like, they're painted on the bottom of the stones. They're painted on the side of the roof stones. And they're painted on the ceiling. They're painted on the walls. And to look at this and go, how on earth did they do this? And it was just an awe that the color is still just as vibrant in most of the temples. Like they literally just painted it yesterday. And I remember one of the temples we went into even had the sand still piled up inside and going, you know, I wonder if, you know, you could just climb the sand and just lay on the back. Would it hold or would you sink into the sand? Because sand is porous. And I don't know so if I'd want to test that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was making me really think, you know, is that what they did? It was like pile up the sand in and then go and do and simply move yeah. the sand to another area. Yeah, I, I you know, that that's one of the theories, you know, um, with a lot of that. Um, huh, yeah, I, I don't know if anybody ever has really figured all that out because some of, I mean, the scale of some of these temples is is quite remarkable. I mean, it, it truly, you know, it, 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 it does make you wonder. I know earlier on you and I were talking about um, in the Temple of Seti at Abydos, uh, are the depictions, are the glyphs of the helicopter, of what looks like um, a UFO um, or a flying saucer. Um, you know, those glyphs, um, I had a very dear friend, um, Dr. Carmen Bolter. She uh, passed away in 2021, I believe it was. I miss her. Um, she did the pyramid codes. Uh, brilliant woman. Um, and, she, you know, I asked her, I said, so what is your take on those glyphs? And she said to me, in all honesty, she said, Kathy, they were depicting what they were seeing. That was her answer. And I thought, yep, that makes sense, doesn't it? Right. Um, <clears throat> and I would go along with that just because if you remember those glyphs, especially the helicopter and the submarine and all of those were on the roof. They weren't like on the bottom to where somebody could quickly go scratch it in. And they were in a very the narrow passageway. So it's almost like two parts of the temple, an older part where the glyphs were and a newer part came to almost fully together, but there was a narrow passageway between the two. And you'd really have to know where those were to even see them. 
Um, they're very, very odd placement um, where they were. Um, and you're right, it would have been high up. It would have been at the ceiling level. Um, I think we're um, but when you see them in person, they're very clearly marked as, you know, a helicopter, as the submarine. I mean, you, you just see that very clearly. I know some people have the theory of, you know, some of that was overlaid and, you know, it just looks that way. Um, I don't know. I, I, I kind of tend to like, you know, uh, Carmen Bolter's theory that like everything else in Egypt, all of the hieroglyphs, they were um, they were writing and and recording what they knew and what they saw. Right, and a thing that can help validate and back her claim is I know I said this would be all about Egypt, but pardon me as I take a little sidestep. Is I believe it was on the island of Crete where they found the temple of Manoa and there's pictures of dinosaurs carved in the rocks. And so again, how would they know clearly what these dinosaurs looked like before we even knew what the dinosaurs looked like or existed? They had to have seen them. So I think there was a lot more seen in the ancient times than we give credit to. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think what she said is true. It feels right to me um, that they were depicting what they were seeing. Um, and yeah, I. Well, you know, and so much. Um, you know, you know, you go into these temples, especially the Great Pyramid. And you look at the size and the tonnage of the stone and the precision that these are stacked against that you couldn't even put a piece of paper between the seams of the stonework. It was so laid precise and the weight of them. And you do, you can't help but think to yourself, okay, did they have some help here perhaps? Um, were they, you know, I think they were probably more technically advanced than, um, a lot of uh, folks give them credit for. Um, and I believe uh, because of the encounter I had in the in the uh, Great Pyramid in the Queen's Chamber, they did have help yeah, from, from other um, extraterrestrial sources. Right, and talking about the Great Pyramid, we all assume it's a four-sided going to a point and it's actually been proven it's eight-sided, that each face has a line down the center. And I I was like, I was, found myself thinking when I was there, looking and going, we were there with the sun. What Did we ever see the shadows? And occasionally I remember seeing the shadow, but it's like I can't remember enough to say, yeah, only half of the side was lit up or the whole side was lit up or, I mean, shadowed by the shade. And so I was like, I kick myself now thinking, God, we were there. We were standing there. We were, when we were on land, sleeping at the foot of it. How did I never think to look to see, is it really one side or is it split in two? <laughs> It's like you're saying in the hindsight, it's like, man, if I had known that now, yeah. then I could have. That's why we have to go well. back. We absolutely <laughs> have to go back. I know, I, I know I'll be back. It's just a matter of when. Uh, I know so much more now uh, and learned so much more um, that um, it's almost like you need to go back, you know, with the knowledge you have now to, to like you said, you know, to, to try and, and, and see if that you can see those eight sides. I'd never heard that before, Michael. Um, interesting. Yeah, and I mean, and we, we think about Egyptians as like I was talking to you backstage. These were a race of people that were carrying spears or spears and riding in chariots. They didn't have any big technology. 
yet they knew how to move a river out of their way to build something for a, their gods. It's like, today it's like we have to do a lot of studies, a lot of, you know, testing and a lot of stuff. And it was like they just did it. And so it's incredible the amount of knowledge we had back then that we're just now getting to the point to where we're on the tip of what they fully knew. Well, and, you know, the other side of it I wanted to share, and again, I didn't know this when I was there, and I, I, I wished I had, so, but, is that the many, there were seven of the Egyptian um, sacred sites uh, that are aligned uh, to be chakra points throughout um, Egypt. And the base chakra is at Philae. The root chakra is Aswan, um, which makes sense. Uh, the sacral chakra, the second chakra is Kom Ombo, which was one of my favorite temples. Um, the solar plexus chakra, the third chakra is at Karnak. And the heart chakra, the fourth chakra is at Dendera. And the throat chakra, the fifth chakra was at Saqqara. Um, the brow chakra, the third eye chakra is at the Sphinx. That didn't surprise me. And the crown chakra, the seventh chakra, is the Great Pyramid. And so all of these sacred sites were used in initiations with the mystery schools. And so, you know, this is where I believe they held the most power is that they were tapping into these other mystical energies that we're all just starting to learn about, but they already knew. And even just the alignment of the three pyramids, the Great Pyramid and the other two pyramids along the Orion Belt is remarkable when you start to think, how is it that they knew? And that, you know, the the Great Pyramid you know, is, is, is also aligned with Sirius. I mean, it's just, just all, it's remarkable, but many of the ancient cultures and, 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 you know, they were, they were aligning all of their sacred sites all over the world. Um, not just in ancient Egypt, but to the select, you know, to the cosmos, to the planets, right. to the stars. Yeah. Well, so I, I find that remarkable. Yeah. Just to piggyback a little bit about the alignment constellation is, I believe it was Farrell wrote a book to where the entire pyramid complex, all nine, line up exactly with the constellation. So it's not, you know, again, it's not just the belt. It's the entire constellation. How would you know how to place each of these temples in this? And size-wise, it was like the brighter the star, the bigger the pyramid. The smaller the size, the was, dimmer. Yeah. And I remember reading, I believe it was, was it before we got there or was it after we left? They found in one of the smaller pyramids, the Ship of Ra, where they actually found a boat that was dedicated to Ra either in or near one of the temples. And it was like it was sending shockwaves through the archaeology community because they were like, we found an intact boat from ancient times in the pyramid complex. Now, that wasn't the one that was um, buried by the sons of Khufu, was it? No? Separate? It could be that one. It's been a while since I've read the article. Yeah. Wow. Well, the raw, you know, of the boat, you know, that that's, you see those depictions throughout Egypt is that was their way of going, you know, into the other world, you know, of the underworld. Um, and they would be carried in their, their barges. Um, and uh, that, yeah, that's depicted everywhere throughout um is that um, sacred practice of, of crossing over, I guess you'd call it, um, yeah. the Book of the Dead. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's kind of interesting to point out that the Egyptian culture 
We think of the Sphinx as this mythological creature that's going to give you a riddle. And if you can't solve it, it's going to devour you. So your life depended on solving the riddle of the Sphinx. And in reality, like the temp was it the Temple of Luxor had the Avenue of the Sphinxes. The Sphinx, the Great Sphinx had anchor holes to where you could tie a ship to the front of its complex. So to me, it was like it was more of a, hey, you've you've entered Egyptian territory, Egyptian culture, not necessarily the, yeah, you're going to die if you walk through here <laughs> kind of persona that we've been given through movies and stuff. Um, interesting you said you could die here when you were speaking of the Avenue with the Sphinxes. Um, I had a remarkable encounter. I don't know if you recall this. I think you were there. I think our whole group was there. We were kind of in the courtyard area of the Avenue of the Sphinx. You know how it comes, you know, as an avenue and then it opens up into a larger courtyard. And so our group was kind of gathered there and we had, you know, hot team and we had a meal, you know, talking to us and pointing things out. And I was drawn. I left the group. This happens to me all the time. I left the group and I was drawn over to the Avenue of the Sphinxes. And I was drawn to this one particular Sphinx. And if I recall, recall properly, most of the sphinxes had ram's heads. Right. There was one sphinx that had a pharaoh head, a you know, with the um, whole pharaoh-shaped headdress and all. And I remember I walked over and I went over and I was going to kind of go to the right of the statue. And I stopped in my tracks and I looked. There was a live jackal. And... He froze. I froze. We're, we're like this far apart. And he looked in my eyes. I looked in his. It's like we looked into each other's souls. It was a remarkable, remarkable experience. I had no fear. I mean, this animal could have jumped and attacked me at any given moment. But that wasn't what was happening. It truly was. We we're looking at, you know, into their souls. And of course, that's Anubis, you know. And I can remember I flagged, like I waved silently to the group and Emil saw me and I, and I pointed down. And at that moment, the jackal had turned around and he very quiet, he just kind of backed up from me a little bit, turned around and just very quietly trotted away. And that's when Emil saw him and I'm like, fuck, fuck. And, he, and, and Emil yells out, it's Anubis, the God of the dead is honoring us. It's Anubis. And I'm like, oh my God. So yeah, Anubis. I made a connection with Anubis right there at the Avenue of the Sphinxes. I mean, it was remarkable. I'll, I'll never forget looking into his eyes. It was it was something. And no fear, you know, didn't get bitten by a jackal that day. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. just and, one of those cool things. Yeah, and one of the things I love about Egyptian culture, especially in their mythologies, is... Because in most cultures, you have the god of life, the god of death, god of, you know, the water. In Egypt, when they say, like, Anubis is the god of the dead, that's not actually his title. He's the god of the underworld, and he was the gatekeeper that would bring you to where you were judged, to where if your soul was as light as a feather... By your deeds, mm -hmm. you could enter into the afterlife and if your soul was deemed too heavy karmically you were swallowed up by segment and had to start over and it's like it's interesting how in egypt the god of the dead is your guide to help you along your way not like example is Hades in Greek mythology is he rules the dead. He keeps you a prisoner in the underworld and keeps you from doing anything. And it's like, it's amazing how the two cultures are close together, but totally different perspectives. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, 
I, I, I want to make sure I have time to share my experience um, in the Great Pyramid. And you played a part in this story. And um, I think it, I think it, I think it's, it's worth talking about because, you know, research I've done after the fact, so much now makes sense to me what happened um, in the Great Pyramid. Um, and you played a key role. I brought with me, um, one of the big reasons why I went on this trip was um, I had acquired, when I took a very specialized training course in Guatemala, of all places, um, I acquired my Egyptian healing rods and they're right here with me. Um, they're copper and zinc, um, very ancient healing tools. Uh, you will often see uh, the pharaohs when they're depicted in statuary, even in, in hieroglyphic form, they're holding what are the wands of Horus or the Egyptian healing rods. And, and back in the ancient times, they the high priests and the pharaohs were the only ones that could carry them uh, because they were very powerful. And so I brought my Egyptian healing rods. So I have them with me in the bus. I'm thinking I'm bringing them into the Great Pyramid so that they'll get like supercharged. And, and, and I was guided the whole time, like pack the handle rods, bring the healing rods. And we get, I don't know if you remember this, we get to the, you know, the bus gets to the base. We're on the Giza Plateau, pyramids are right in front of us. And William must have gone up, I think at some point and comes back to tell us that evidently the day before someone had carved their name. If you can even imagine that, carved their name into one of the walls in the Great yeah. Pyramid. <clears throat> so that they weren't allowing us to bring anything in. I didn't even think we could bring our cameras, our phones in, could we? I I'm, I don't think so, because I don't have any I, pictures inside. I think it had to be in your pocket. If it, You couldn't, okay. like, carry anything in your hands. It had to be in your pockets. Well, you were kind enough, because I'm panicking, going, oh, my God, I got to bring in my great, I, I got to bring in the healing rods. And you had a big sweatshirt on with two big pockets. And you're like, Kelly, yeah, I'll take them. So you like put them deep down in your pockets and we go up. And I was ahead of you. I I, I got through because I had otherwise had just little small things. Like I had some crystals and, you know, a pendulum and all that stuff to be charged. So you had the healing rods. And then you come up behind me and they start patting you down. You're like, what? We got the healing rods. And do you remember it was Emil. He had an incredible yelling match with those two guards and, you know, and Emil arguing that, you know, the healing rods are, you know, they're mine. We need to bring them into the Great Pyramid. They're healing rods. They're not, you know, they're not going to deface the Great Pyramid with them. Right. <laughs> and it was loud. It was, I was getting scared. I'm like, oh my God, they wouldn't give back the rods. So I'm like, I'm losing it. So I, I got very angry. And so I stormed away thinking, oh, great. Now I just lost my healing rods. And I start to descend up into the Great Pyramid. And you know how funky that is. It's like, you know, it's a carved out tunnel type of thing. And you're going up like a wooden, like ramp ladder thing. And I am just each footstep. I'm like mad going, Ugh! and then all of a sudden I hear this, yeah, thing, yeah, thing. And I turn around and there's a nail behind me. He goes, I got your rods. And he pats both pockets. And he, so he put my healing rods. They allowed him to carry them in the Great Pyramid, thank God. I couldn't, but they allowed him to. So my healing rods get in there. Uh, he and I sat together um, against the wall. You know how we, when we went into the king's chamber, um, the only thing in there is, is the sarcophagus. Right. Um, and then, so we all sat along the walls. And there was a whole group of men in there who were keeping an eye on us. You remember that. And so, you know, Emil, you know, sat next to me. And um, and then William and Claire, part of that private um, um, experience we had in the Great Pyramid was to each of us go in and lay down in the sarcophagus. Do you remember what right. happened to you when you went in there? Because, boy... I, I do. And the interesting thing is, is when we say sarcophagus, we're talking black obsidian, single piece, larger than the doorway. So it's like how it got in there, 
they had to have placed it and built the pyramid around it. But, yeah, and I remember as we're laying in there, we crossed our hands like the pharaohs. And um, William took a tuning fork to the left foot and then the right upper by the shoulder tapping the sarcophagus. And for me, I felt myself slip right out and pass through like a gate, almost like a stargate, I guess. And standing in front of me when I come to are all the gods of Egypt. And I'm and they're all just talking, doing their own thing. And I'm like, and I remember thinking, and I think I even said it to them as, what are you guys doing? Have you seen what's going on in the world back there? And to be honest, I cannot remember if they answered me or not. But just being in the presence of them and then feeling myself sucked back into the sarcophagus, back in and William lifting us out and thinking that was really cool because it wasn't guided. And every one of us had a different unique experience it wasn't like oh we're all gonna go see you know so it was that was the cool part was nobody had an identical experience you know i asked william and claire if i could go up last i just intuitively knew i needed to be last let everyone else have their time and, and i'll be last and it Something took over my body um, as I approached the sarcophagus. Um, I can remember I stepped into it and I can remember I faced our group and I bowed down and I believe that was north. And then um, I had Claire on one side, William on the other, and then Carol came up behind me. So I bowed down to all four corners, north, south, east and west. And I can remember there was like a little um, rumbling in our group going, what is she doing? You know, and. And I don't know what I was doing, but like you, there's something that takes over. And so for me, I felt as though I had been here before, all familiar to me. And as I laid down in the sarcophagus, again, I felt like I, I've been here before. I know this. And the very last thought I had, Michael, was I've stopped breathing. And then I was gone. I was out of my body. I went, I don't know where I went. I know it was quite a ways away. And I, it was remarkable. And then all of a sudden, um, see, you have some recall as to where you went. I haven't quite gotten my recall yet, or at least not in that specific moment. I've, I've had things come to me after the fact. And he, uh, William, had to shake my feet, literally like this, Kathy, Kathy. Yeah. So for me to come back in my body, I can remember that whooshing feeling of coming back in my body and, you know, helping me up. And so me being the last one, the rest of the group was gathering. Claire was starting to bring everybody downstairs, going down to the queen's chamber. And I can remember I was very, very wobbly. Like I truly was. It was like I had one leg out of the sarcophagus, one leg in the sarcophagus, and I was straddling two worlds. And to the point that Hatim came up, and I said this to you when we were in the waiting room, Hatim and I had a very, very close connection. Um, past life shares shared for sure. And he, um, he, he kind of said, you know, take your time. Take your time, find your footing. Claire, in the meantime, came in and said, Kathy, come on, let's go. We're going down to the queen's chamber. I could barely walk. I couldn't even get my other leg out of the sarcophagus. And so Hatim came over and, and he said to Claire, let her be. She needs to settle in her body. Let her be. She, you know, she needs to wait here a bit more. And Claire was having none of it. <laughs> so I said to Hatim, I said, don't worry. I'm okay. I'm, I'll go down to the queen's chamber. But he came up to me and he said to me, Kathy, I see you. Okay. And he goes like this. I see you. And I knew right then and there that we had shared um, these experiences. And uh, what I've learned about the Great Pyramid is that it was one of the initiation temples of the um, 
uh, mystery schools and that we were taught to practice living resurrection so that it was a process of being taught to through almost like a death, a spiritual death. You stop breathing and that's when you go out of your body like what you did, like what I did and what the initiates would do. And you were taught to literally have a living resurrection and that you resurrected and you traveled. And who has a fabulous book on this subject is Freddie Silva. I don't, I'm sure you're probably familiar with his work. Yes. He has a book called The Lost Art of Resurrection. And it's about all of this. And it's about how there are so many different cultures, not just the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Prussians, the Indians, Cel Celtics, the Native Americans, they all had this resurrection um, piece to their teachings. And it was learning how to, you know, die and have a living resurrection. And so that was one of the things they, they taught us in the mystery school. So all of that was familiar to me. And I thought, oh my God. Okay, so that's what happened. So great book, I, I highly recommend it. And then um, we, I joined everybody down in the Queen's Chamber. And I, um, you know, I, I thought my experience in the sarcophagus was gonna be like the, the, the big finale going into the, the Great Pyramid. But let me tell you, when I went down into the Queen's Chamber, okay, it was literally, I will say to you, out of this world. Um, so I, I walk in and I'm sure you recall, you walk in and it's, um, you know, a smaller chamber than the King's chamber above. And, um, as you know, as I walked in, I was guided. It was just it, it, something again, took over. I went to my immediate right and there on the wall is a, um, one of the air shafts. And it was interesting. Um, cause I can remember looking at it going, Hmm. It's exactly my height. I'm 5'3". And it was about an 8 by 10 opening, you know, like this. And I'm guided. I go and I put my face in this ancient air shaft. Now, that would never normally be something I would think to do. But again, it's it was almost like it was out of my hands what was happening. And so I'm guided to do that. And I'm standing there. And of course, you know, it's a dark, old, ancient air shaft. So I could see the edges of the air shaft and then it, you know, it disappears into an absolute blackness. And I can remember my mind going, why am I doing this? <laughs> and then it, it, that thought went and I thought, okay, here I am. I'm doing this. I'm doing what I'm being told to do. And all of a sudden, this beautiful pink red light appears way down the shaft. And in the in the absolute blackness, and it comes up, and it's and it's like an arc shaped. It was very interesting, and I can remember noting that. That's interesting. It's an arc arced shape, like a window, like an arched window. But the color was just stunning. And as I stood there and looking at this, going, "Wow, what is this all about?" Then this, I, I, all I can say is this being started to appear. So from the very bottom of where the arched window is. I see this like, like a head shape, rounded shape, start to come up, come up, and you can clearly then see it's a head. This being comes up and up, and then all of a sudden I'm seeing a full head. Um, and I can remember, I thought to myself, interesting, this is not shaped like a gray's head, which is like an egg, uh, an enlarged egg-shaped head. This head was more oval. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. And its eyes fit the shape of its head. Um, you know, unlike a gray sort of very much larger. Um, and this being was this most beautiful shade of a light blue green. And against that, that, that pink red light, it was stunning. And I can remember going, oh my God, he had a little thin neck. He had little shoulders. Um, I, you know, obviously I see his eyes. Um, I don't recall seeing a nose or a mouth, but he communicated to me telepathically. And I had absolutely no fear. So again, something that I would think, um, you know, I'd be scared out of my wits and I'd be running out. Um, I stood there and this being communicated to me telepathically. And 
he would he emanated such love and happiness he was so happy and again telepathically he was so happy that he could show himself to me he said we're happy that you have no fear and that now we can show ourselves to you and then he went on to say how they come come in peace that they are just beings of love and that they came in and helped establish many of the ancient civilizations, the Egyptian civilization in particular, and that they come in love. They just want to help humankind. And so that's what they did is they established these ancient civilizations. And then he, um, he said to me, that he would come to me again. Now that I don't hold any fear, they will show themselves to me again. So it was rather a short message, but again, all telepathic. And that, you know, again, I, I can't even begin to describe the sense of happiness and love that emanated from this being. And I, and I say this, uh, you know, knowing that I have some dear friends who are abductees, who have had contact and less good experiences. Um, some of them are quite harrowing. Um, my experience was one of love and happiness with this being. Um, that's exactly all that it just emanated. And then he started to kind of like just lightly fade away. And then the light behind him faded away. And I can remember standing there feeling like elated, like what just happened? This, what? this, is, this, is, this is amazing. So the best part of the story is that prior to me going to Egypt, I had a reading with a medium. I would say maybe two weeks before I left for Egypt. Um, it was around my birthday in February because we were in Egypt in March. And the medium says to me, oh, um, I, have, I have your guides are here. They're all around us. And they want me to tell you this message that there are gonna be three things that will happen to you when you're in Egypt. It will be soul retrieval, it will be astral projection, and it will be an alien encounter. So I'm sitting there, the gal who's, you know, you know, communicating this message, like, is like, what? <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, okay, that's strange, wow. So. You know, I kind of had that message in the back of my mind. Never in a million years would I have thought that in the Queen's Chamber of the Great Pyramid, I would encounter exactly what they foretold, an alien being. I like to call him a being. I don't like that term alien. And um, that's exactly who I met. So it was a remarkable encounter. Um, and one that, you know, after I came home, and I didn't speak of it when I was in you know in the group i i at least i don't recall saying anything to anybody um I don't I, you anything. yeah i think i i i was processing going okay i don't know if i should talk about this i mean it's a very unusual experience only to come home michael and a week after i got home my dear friend linda called and said you know let's get together for lunch i want to hear all about egypt and we get there to lunch and I start telling my story, you know, just what I spoke about. And she goes, oh, my God. And I say, what? She goes, do you know of um, Tom Kenyon's work? And I went, no, I've never heard of Tom Kenyon. Who is he? And she pulls out this book. And she, she this is her book. All of these are her ragged notes in her book. And she opens the book to the part of the book where what Tom Kenyon does is he's a channel for the Hathor beings, which were beings who were, who came and helped establish the um, ancient civilizations. Everything that is in that book was exactly what that being told me. And I'll just read you part of this. Um, you know, she, it was unbelievable. She opens the chapter to who are we and why have we come? And then the, you know, it's, um, it's Tom Kenyon and Virginia Essene. So they both do the channel. So this particular one was channeled by Virginia Essene. 
And she said that um, in the book, Virginia is speaking, channeling one of the Hathors. He spoke and confirmed they came in during and before the Egyptian period, approximately 10,000 BC, after the fall of Atlantis. He said, we are masters of sound, energy, and love. And that's exactly what this being was, was love, pure love. They made contact through the early Egyptians through the goddess Hathor, which they experienced through mystical visions. So the Hathors were able to help the Egyptians create a spiritual golden age, which culminated in the creation of the mystery schools. And quotes, we were physically present clairvoyantly, meaning that we would move around the earth, interacting consciously with others, but we could only be seen by the humans with clairvoyant sight. So this is what's interesting. I am a clairvoyant. And so that this being, I think, knew that I would be able to see him just as they appeared and helped the Egyptian civilization way back when those who were clairvoyant then could see them. And they were very tall. They were like about nine feet tall, but they were that light blue green color. And they said that at the time, many of the Egyptian um, artists would depict them in at the very top of the um, temple columns throughout Egypt. So obviously the temple of Hathor, um, if you recall, has the carved heads of the Hathor at the very top of all of the columns in that temple. And unbeknownst to me, Michael, the entire trip through Egypt, I was focused on taking pictures of all the Hathor columns, temples, everything Hathor, only to then realize that 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 was the being that showed himself to me um, and that they are around me. Um, I, I had another I had a reading with a, a very powerful gentleman, um, Chris Rao, and he saw the beings with me. Um, they were here. And the being I communicated with stepped forward and to let me know um, that he's there with me as a guide and that Chris described exactly to a T the being I saw in the Great Pyramid. And Chris knew nothing about this story. He knew nothing about my encounter. And so, yeah, it was a nice way to kind of just um, validate what had happened to me because it seemed like, okay, this is a little much, um, but it happened. Um, it was remarkable. And the amazing thing is how our stories are almost opposites to where I remember my experience totally in the King's Chamber. Well, maybe not totally, but majority of it and have like, I remember talking about the Queen's Chamber, but no memory of ever entering the Queen's Chamber. And Interesting. Yours is, you have bits and pieces of the King's Chamber, but totally remember the Queen's Chamber. And so it's kind of interesting how being in the same group, it's like when you first said, to me, I remember when we were on Paranormal Verses and you go, you remember the Queen's Chamber, right? And I was like, did I go in there? It's like I, I wow. have literally no memory. <clears throat> and that, that happens to me a lot where I will I will go somewhere and the memory will be blocked until it's like my guys will say it's blocked until you need it. And I'm always like, well, how do I know when I need it? <laughs> That's kind of like, can't, can't you just like unlock it? Because how do I know I don't need it now? It's like. Do you recall? Um, because when I took my face out of the air shaft in the Queen's Chamber, I stood there. I was a bit shaken. Um, and then I listened. <clears throat> so I was by myself at that point in the Queen's Chamber. Everybody had gone back upstairs to the King's Chamber and they were doing toning. Do you recall that? Do you recall hearing the toning, oh my God, it was otherworldly. And I, See, remember I don't even remember the there. toning. Yeah. Oh, well, there's a recording. I have a recording. William sent it to me. He recorded it on his iPhone. It's remarkable because it starts out human voices, clearly. There's a point in the recording where something happens. I believe um, 
it was the Hathor beings. Because if you remember what I what they speak of, they were, you know, love. They're all about sound and frequency. And as I stood there and heard the toning and I heard, I, I noticed the shift in it and it got to be like otherworldly is the best word I could describe the sound. And I can remember standing there and the words that came into my mind were um, music of the spheres. Now I had no idea what that was at that time. I know now that's Pythagoras's theory that all the planets <laughs> emit sound. And um, did you hear that? No, yeah, my dogs are going out. Oh, okay. The squirrel. <laughs> and so that, you know, I do believe it was the music of the spheres. I believe that that's what took over their voices and they were channeling the music of the spheres. It was beautiful. Just beautiful. Yeah. And what's amazing is leading up to this um, experiences that we were having, was we kind of let that a couple of key things were we went to one temple and did light activation to where we had a sunbeam come in through a portal in the temple and i mean we we all have seen where the sun shines on your face and it just you know makes it look a little bit brighter this was, you couldn't make out the face whatsoever. It was like our faces completely disappeared. The whole head disappeared. It's like all you see is a shaft of light. And I remember the energy going through, and it's like I could feel starting, you know, processes. And we would also go to other temples and... We, um, I remember going up and hugging and I can't remember if we did tonage or not with the statue of Ptah, the builder, the creator. And yeah, so, that statue's alive as well. <clears throat> yeah. And I remember that. And so it was like, yeah, we, we were doing stuff at every temple, I feel like. And William had told us when we started this that this was the ascension path. And it was interesting how, you know, you pointed out the chakras that it's like, I don't remember if we correlated those or not while we were there that this would be the root recall. chakra or... No, I don't recall that. I would have remembered that. Um, you know, so again, you know, how it works for me and I think for you is that, you know, you have the experience. I, you know, did the deep dive when I got home for years and still do it to just, you know, uh, research the knowledge. Um, and then there's... Michael, there's knowledge that I have come into this lifetime with. Um, you know, I believe all of us, um, you know, we're, you know, some of this knowledge is, I believe, my thought is it's encoded into our DNA. So I've had these past lifetimes in Egypt. You know, just an example, the connection I had and the strong connection I had to be guided to go to Guatemala to get these healing rods. I mean, that was no easy feat. And I know I've used these in past lifetimes. Um, they're very powerful, especially now being charged in the Great Pyramid. In fact, the first time I picked them up to use them, in fact, I was guided. I couldn't hold them for like six months after I got back from Egypt. I was actually afraid to because you could just feel the energy emanating from them. When I first used them on a friend who had kidney stones, I held them in my hands. She's in front of me. I'm, you know, getting ready to aim them towards the area that I could tell her stones were. And I got thrown back off my feet as I just did this. I just was, you know, pointing them to her. If there was not my coffee table behind me, I would have been flat out on my back. I mean, they were that powerful. She jumped back and went, oh my God, what just happened? And so I, you know... I think, you know, I think some of what goes on here is past life recall. Um, 
And, you know, we are, I believe you've had, I just have just such a sense that you've had Egyptian lifetimes as well. And many of us have, um, and that you're drawn back to that. You're drawn back to certain teachings. Um, you know, like the recall of knowing for sure I had been in the great pyramid into the king's chamber, that sarcophagus, hands down, knew it. And that feeling of laying down in it and knowing that I basically went through the process of a living resurrection. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I've written about it. It's fascinating. You know, uh, these these journeys we take and the recall we have um, is remarkable. Yeah, and I think, was it Saqqara? Did you ride the camel? I know I rode the camel at Saqqara. Mm -hmm. No camel for this girl. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, I don't think that would have been pretty at all. <laughs> but yeah, and I remember too, you know, so, I mean, I don't remember if we talked to William and Claire about it or not, but we got to one of the cities and we told all of our drivers of our carts, race to this temple we we want to get to the temple first and so we had a cart race through the cities on these streets and <laughs> i forgot who won but it was like it was i remember just it was like i guess it was a day where we just had to go and have fun we had to let loose yeah and have fun. it can be heavy you know you're going into these these very dense energies and uh yeah it gets heavy so yeah, yeah you gotta lighten it up <laughs> and then was kamombo the one that we went to when they were like well this area is underwater because this is where they kept the crocodiles and we we're like yes so bad Wait, yeah we're, we're the gods walking. so bad down yeah. there are oh, there yeah. any still in there and they're like we don't know i'm like that's not the answer we want to hear <laughs> you know what was interesting at komombo um you know having done a little bit of homework before i left uh for this trip is i remember being fascinated by the ear steels that were there so these were carved um, um areas where they actually carved ears into the stone and what the ancient egyptians would do is that was like for them it was like a place where they could go and talk to the gods directly and so in a sense they would go and, and whisper into the carved ear you know of the gods and that's how they would you know one way of for them to communicate to the gods so in different temples there were this ear steals but you know, they weren't advertised at all. So I thought it was odd as we're going through Komombo and Emil's not mentioning the ear steals. And so I, I, I can remember I raised my hand. I'm going, could you point out where the ear, ear steals are? And he about fell over. He's like, what? You know about this? What? And then he was like so proud to be able to show me where that was. And I was just like, okay, I think I just got a gold sticker on my forehead. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was an it was an amazing trip. It truly was. Um, it was, and I mean, just the ironic things of I can't. It's like so many things of like I can remember some things, but not the other. But my roommate throughout this entire adventure was born on the same day I was. Remember, we celebrated your birthdays and, together. That was like the was, last day we were there, right? Yeah. And um, it was like, of all the things, it's like, mm -hmm. that, that would just, to me, was like one of the ones that just boggled me. And I still have the papyrus that you all gave me where you all signed the car. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Speaking of papyrus, I don't know if you can see behind me above the, the sideboard I have here is... The papyrus that I got in Egypt, and it depicts um, Tutankhamun and his wife, who was also his half sister, Ankhis and Amun. Um, it's a beautiful papyrus. Um, there's gold in it, actual gold. It's stunning. But do you know I kept that rolled up in the original um, container that I went home with it, and it was only last year that I found it. And I'm like, 
oh my God, I totally forgot I had this. And it, to the point that I had to very, very gently unroll it. I felt like I was unrolling the Dead Sea Scrolls, honest to God. And I'm like, oh my God. And parts of it were crinkling away and they um, did some restoration work to it and framed it for me. And I've got a black obsidian um, pyramid that sits at the base of it. And it's like one of my prized possessions now is that, is that um, scroll. Yeah, and eating the food, it was like everything. And I, I forget which, if it was a temple or if we were on a day off where we were on the city and all of a sudden it was like we're like walking up to this hotel and and it was like it seemed like it was in the middle of the nile but i don't think it really was but it's like we had to walk up and we're like look at these views and it was like yeah man that was a nice hotel <laughs> yes i know which one you mean yeah i can remember thinking oh if i come back i'm gonna stay at this hotel <laughs> yeah i was like Man, what does it take to get a room here? But yeah, and I I was just amazed at the food. It's like because you hear of going to certain places and you can't eat this or you can't eat that. That it was like everything we ate seemed to be just fine. And I remember the um, gentleman on the boat. They were really nice. Of if you want something special. Put your order in by this time, pay, and then the next day pay, and they bring you what you asked for. They go and find it. I can remember a few bottles of wine appearing that way <laughs> <laughs> for dinner. <laughs> um, yeah, it was. Um, it was. It was it was just amazing. Um, you know, I have to say, Michael, I did a two part series. I wrote about our. Um, extensive visit throughout Egypt uh, for Phenomena magazine um, called um, Egypt, a soul's journey. And um, it's remarkable when you like put your mind to writing about it, what the recall was that came back. Cause like you were saying, you know, there are things you don't remember or recall. And, and that was almost a perfect exercise for me to recall so much Um and then, you know, doing it, what, that was back in 2014. So many years have now passed. I've done so many, uh, you know, different, you know, studies and research on some of what we experienced and I experienced that, you know, I, I come at it now with, with more knowledge than I had when I was there in 2014. And um, so that's, um, that, yeah, you know, to be published like that, it was, it was quite an honor, you know, and, and of all things, my, my, uh, travels through Egypt, our travels. <laughs> it was, uh, and we've only touched the surface of where we went. I mean, that right. was an extensive journey. That was a full two weeks. We did Egypt. Um, yeah. And, and uh, yeah. I'd have to say, as a podcast host, if we were to delve totally into the experiences we had, it would probably be a series unto itself. I don't, I, I don't know. Probably. Well, you think five or six one hour episodes at least just to start to get into it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, 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 you know, some of the experiences I've had, um, not only did they happen live there in Egypt, as, as I just, you know, talked about the being that came to me, but I had some interesting things happen to me after the fact I got home, Michael. So that's where the astral projection came in. Because I can remember thinking, okay, the soul retrieval, I knew right away. I mean, obviously, I was returning right. home. I mean, that was that was a no-brainer. Yeah, okay, total soul retrieval happening here throughout this trip. And But the astral travel piece was remarkable. And you spoke about your, when you were in the sarcophagi, where you traveled to and you were amongst the gods, that's what happened to me. Um, I astral traveled back to Egypt. And again, into an initiation ceremony in the king's chamber. And that's all of my God, all the gods and guides were there. Isis, both. I mean, they were all there. It was, it was remarkable. Um, but so I'm glad to know that you saw them as well. You know, because I mean, there's something about having that validation of someone else sharing an experience 
that, you know, because we don't always, when we have these mystical experiences, um, you don't always have somebody there to validate it. You don't always have a camera. Um, you'll oftentimes just have the experience and be left with this, like, like what happened seeing that being the wonderment of it all. And then afterwards, you're like, God, I wish I had some, I wish I had a camera. I took a picture or, you know, yeah. I recorded something or whatever, but that's not usually what happens when you have these no. incredible experiences. Um, you just have to trust, you know, the person who's, who's had the experience. And so I loved hearing, you know, what you experienced because it validates so much of what I experienced too. And the interesting thing talking about pictures was I remember in Saqqara when we were down in the inner of the pyramids, I took a picture of one of the sarcophaguses and there's this blue strange light that looks like it's about this tall that's got a bunch of stuff. And I remember showing it to everyone and going, can you tell me what this is? And everyone's like, well, I think that's a light. I said, here's where it took the picture. Where's the light? And we're all like, there is no light. To this day, I have not been able to explain what that blue light was. And it only showed up in one photo. Of oh, all the photos of the sarcophaguses. Yeah, and those were something. Oh my God, yeah. the scale of those, the weight of the stone, the precision. Good Lord. Um, again, it speaks to, you know, how, how is that done? Yeah. Right. And the ironic thing is, we were talking about the Great Pyramid, the sarcophagus being at the top. These were at the bottom, so it's like they had to be laid in the pyramid going up because there is no doorway, no back door in any of these pyramids that are sized for these sarcophaguses. And it's like you look at these sarcophaguses, and I remember now thinking about it going... I think these Egyptians must have been like almost like giants. We think of them as normal size, but those sarcophaguses were way bigger than we would. Well, be. weren't those the sarcophagi that they used for the apis bulls? So, but even with that, a bull is a bull. Those things you could fit five bulls in. I mean, right. they were huge. And there is a theory out there that they were some type of, um, battery generators i've seen i've seen that theory tossed around about those um for what that's worth <laughs> but no, I, I believe it because the pyramids are thought to be power generators themselves and so it's interesting to try and correlate and sit there and go you know yeah how did they build it but then it's like, for what purpose did they build it? We think they're burials, but they're not because the pharaohs were buried in the Valley of the Kings, not in the pyramids. So, yeah, it's like, what? And I don't think any, I could be wrong, but I don't think any mummies were ever found in pyramids. They're all. Not that I know. In the. Nope. Valley of the Kings or a few other areas, but yeah. And I remember going into the Valley of the Kings, and like you said, the one temple was closed. But was it SETI that we got to go into the temple and it was like brand new, newly discovered in the Valley oh. of the Kings? And so we got to go in and see. Stunning. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I think if I'm not mistaken, Michael, that is the um, and I forgive me, I forget which pharaoh, but it could have been SETI um, that they had the entire universe depicted on the um, on on the, the ceiling. ceiling. It was it's just stunning um, depicting stars and different beings and planets. I mean, it's just like, you know, again, you think to yourself, how? Um, I mean, how did they know about all of this? Um, but they're very much, um, you know, the heavens, they, they 
studied the heavens. I mean, they were depicting um, the skies. You know, of course, you had the sky goddess, Newton, and all of that. So it's, um, yeah, it's. It's, it's funny how we talk about Toth and Thoth. And it's like, you look at Newt's name and it's like, if you look at it in English, it's nut, but it's pronounced Newt. <laughs> it's like, I can't, it was like, I remember looking at that the first time I was like, I had to flip back and look and go, wait, did, is this God named right? Who <laughs> named this as a nut as a God? <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah. With some. I'll be back, as they say, one of these days. I'll get myself back there. Um, I can only imagine what will happen on the second go around, <laughs> seeing as the first one was so action packed with I just, know, I'm... that spiritual, um, incredible experiences. Um, but again, that's what all those temples were built for. You know, they were, they, if you ask me, they were all energy um, driven. Um, just um, very sacred, you know, they were for the initiates. Um, and uh, it's amazing that that energy is all still there. You know, you can tap right into it. And the amazing thing is we started in Cairo, but then we ended up taking a flight to another city to board the boat to sail back up to Cairo and it's just, it's amazing when you think about, it took us, I think, was it like seven days on the Nile? But we, you know, um, William chose which temples to go to, and I don't think there was an accident. And he said we were going in a specific order. I remember that. <clears throat> there was a reason we were going in the order we did. Yeah. And... It was just incredible, and to see the sunsets was one thing, but my my fondest memory is waking up before dawn, and everybody is in the bus, tired, and we're like, and to get off the boat, mind you, we had to most times walk on a plank. That mm -hmm. was in little plank so it's like in the dark you're like where's my footing going most nights or... yeah we didn't lose anybody did we <laughs> nope and yeah. going and sitting on this wall in the dark and william's like just wait for it you you'll trust me this will be worth it and we're like why are we up so early and then it's like you see the sun come up and you're like yeah, it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, the Temple of Fila. Yeah, that was stunning to see that. We did that at Hesepshut's uh, temple, funerary temple as well, um, because that temple was aligned that the entire, at one point, the, the Avenue of the Sphinxes went all the way down from, I believe it was Karnak, all the way down to her temple. And when the sun come came up, it just blazed a path all the way down. Um, I think the avenue, avenue of the Sphinx actually lines up with Karnak. Okay. Luxor and Karnak are the ones that they're in lineup. Hepsuts is off to the side, and we were discussing this backstage that on the way to Hepsuts Temple. We passed through the mountains where the Nag Hammadi was found. And we were, I wasn't sure if it was Nag Hammadi, but we confirmed it was the Nag Hammadi. And so I remember feeling and looking. It's like, because in the bus, we're pretty much looking at each other and talking. And as we approached the mountains, I remember looking out the window at the mountains. And then William goes, Oh, and for any of you who are interested, this is where this was found. And I was like, wow, that's where it's from. And just like in awe that it's like how you could find something amongst all of that is like, wow. Well, you know, there is, I believe, still so much more to, to be discovered. And, you know, we're, we're now 
with our technology getting into the ground penetrating radar. And so to have, you know, these vast areas um, where we're finding the temple remains, there's so much more under the sand. And I think we're just now taking, you know, steps to discover what's underneath still. Um, right. So there'll be a lot to still find. And I, I don't know about you, but I still have the opinion of even with ground penetrating radar, satellite imagery, like the Hall of Records, if it is under the Sphinx's paw, I don't think it's going to show up on ground penetrating radar or anything because it was so in the mystery school that, you know, only select people were to find it that they would not make it to where, oh, radar is going to find this chamber underneath there. I think it'll still be hidden from the radar. There definitely are chambers under the Sphinx. I can remember speaking with um, Carmen Bolter about that. She actually went underneath the Sphinx. She's got, if you Google her and you look, there's there's a couple of interviews of her speaking about this. It's mind blowing that there are actually tunnels under the Sphinx and that's a known fact. Um, but I think you're right to some degree you know, say the Hall of Records, um, say the Emerald Tablets, you know, they, I don't think are just sitting there. I think you have to enter into those spaces um, with a reverence, with, you know, almost like, you know, there's, there's like a certain, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, you have ceremonial you. way that you can enter into those places. Like when I enter in, to the Akashic records, you know, I go in with my guide, who is Jesus, as I mentioned. And, you know, you do, I, I set up a whole entire whole prayer thing when I go in. I make it very reverent to, and I'm very grateful to have the ability to go in. And so I don't think just anybody can see that or touch that or, right. you know, but I've seen it. It's remarkable. Yeah. yeah. Edgar Casey. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, we're actually at an hour and 34 minutes. So, <laughs> so I, Michael, we might have to do a series. <laughs> well, I think we, we just might. We scratched the surface. <laughs> I think we might. And, you know, it's not to take a word from my friend Brad Olson, but I'm finding a lot of Egypt is more esoteric than we realize. But yeah. so. I think we're just coming back to understanding that, you know, I think the ancient knowledge, I believe, was never lost. There are those who incarnate as wisdom keepers and ha Hakim um, Awan was one of them. Um, and so that ancient knowledge is not gone. It's just mm -hmm. certain certain souls incarnate with it. And I think that's what we're starting to see. I think there's a lot of like-minded people, you know, who have some of this encoding, who come into this incarnation with this knowledge. And they're the ones who are discovering and out there making these groundbreaking discoveries and or rediscovering some of this ancient knowledge. Um, yeah. And it's like, buckle your seatbelt. There's a lot more to be known about. <laughs> yeah. So we, I'm sure... We will have you on again and continue this fun. journey. And I want to thank you and thank the people who came in the chat. I know. Room. Thank you, guys. This is great. I loved my time here, Michael. Thank you. And thank you for coming on. And I will bid a, let's see, it's afternoon for us, but for whoever's watching, whether you're in the evening, <laughs> if you're in the afternoon like we are, or if you're just starting your day, make it a blessed one. And thank you for watching. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Always a thank pleasure. You. Yep. Bye-bye, everyone. You have just listened to the energy that surrounds us with your host, Michael Koff. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode.